The Holy Gospel this morning comes from St. Luke in the fourth chapter. Well, then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Isn't this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Well, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in a prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And there were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out to the edge of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might throw him off the cliff. But he passed through them in the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. It is always good to remember that Jesus almost never made it out of his hometown. <laughs> to know that this is, the, you know, this is chapter 4, we still got 24 chapters to go. This is the very beginning. He's done some miracles up north in Capernaum and Cana and stuff like this. He goes back to his hometown. Um, and, and, you know, and then it's, it's human nature, right? I mean, we, 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 we hear all these stories about things and, and we assume that if, they, if somebody who was part of us, part of our community, grew up with us, you know, this was the kid that we raised, taught Sunday school to, those types of things, that, you know, if they were doing great things for, for those folks, you know, in Tecama, certainly when they got back to Blair, we'd reap some benefit. But, of course, that's not what happens, right? Jesus actually says to his family and his friends, those who have raised him, now I know you heard me do great things and in Cana, and you know, you heard me do some great things in healing and Capernaum and whatnot. But you got to remember that, you know, in the time of uh, in the time of the Great Famine, God didn't feed any Israelite woman. God fed a foreigner, someone who was non-Jewish. And then when Elisha was healing lepers, he didn't heal any Israel lepers. He he healed the Syrian leper. And at that moment, all the folks in Nazareth, their faces, they realized dang, here we brought all this water expecting the dude to change it into wine and he ain't going to do it, you know? So, so they're all like, oh man, we've, for the last six days we've been storing up water just so we could get our wine cellar filled and now the guy's saying, hey, that was a one-time shot, Cana only. And so they're just like, well, what's going on here? And so then they do the obvious thing when somebody um, disappoints you, they, they try to kill him. You know, and, and you got to admit, you got you know, maybe if you were have if, if you've ever raised a teenager and, and they get a little rebellious, they know, you know, they'll do, you know, teenagers they'll go out into the world and everybody they'll be nice and polite and stuff like that, and people will come back and say, "Gosh, your kid is the nicest kid. They help me clean. They help me do all this stuff." And you're saying, "My kid never lifted a hand. I want to just throw him or her off a cliff most of the time." Yeah. It's the folks in Nazareth, right? They, they heard all these great stories about Jesus, and yet when he gets back, he's like, eh, not for you. I'm going to throw my dirty socks in the corner. Mom, if you could clean those up, that would be great. So Jesus, you know, he almost never gets it. And I often wonder, you know, Jesus is on the cross dying. A few years later, for most scholars, this takes these, this story uh, in uh, early part to Nazareth, and his death on the cross is about three years apart. So three years later, does he say to himself as he's on the cross, Wow, I avoided getting thrown off a cliff just to die on a cross, you know. It's just one of those strange stories. But we all have those strange stories that are part of our history, that, that are part of our lives, that, that, uh, that, that just sort of lay there dormant. They don't, they don't necessarily um, impact us too much. They're part of our identity, perhaps. They're part of deep-seated uh, realities of who we are or what we are about. But, 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 they, but they happened so long ago, or, or there were so many things that intervened between that one experience and, and our current reality that we've long since forgotten it. 
And actually, our, our family has a story like that, that that actually has to do with today, February 3rd. 60 years ago today, to the day, 60 years ago, before I was born, there was a plane crash in Clear Lake, Iowa that killed Richie Valens, the Big Bopper, and Buddy Holly. 60 years ago today. If you can remember that, it means you're 61. So it's part of our story because it just so happened that Buddy Holly was my mother's favorite musician at the time. Now, many of you have met my mother, and, uh, and you know, she's a great person. But back in the day, 60 years ago, uh, my mom was working as a, as a legal secretary in Duluth, Minnesota, and she had just gotten a new car. And, uh, you know, she was on her own a little bit. She was still living with my, my grandparents at the time, but, but she was looking to get her own apartment. She was looking to do all this kind of stuff. She had a job now. She had a car. She was going to be, be a woman of the 50s. And um, so her and three of her girlfriends went to uh, the Buddy Holly concert uh, in, outside of Min in Minnesota. And uh, when they got back, they decided that they would try to go and see the concert in Clear Lake. And so they, they, now they all thought about it. Now this concert was going to be like on a Thursday night or something like that. I can't remember the exact day of the week. But what does matter is that what my mom and her girlfriend's plan was, was to get my mom's new car, drive from Duluth, Minnesota, down to Clear Lake, Iowa, go to the concert, and then drive back, and then get up and go to work the next morning. Okay, that was their plan. But when you're young, those things seem to make sense. You know, it, you have to live for a while before you realize that's just stupid. Okay, so all the, all, the, all the kids are going, oh yeah, that makes sense, and stuff like this, and Delta are like, duh, 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 duh. So anyhow, they were going to do this plan, they were going to get in the car, you know, and, 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 and for this story, you've got to remember that I've heard this story since it happened before I was born. I mean, I've heard this story all my life, literally, you know, it's a story that my mom's told, she may have told it to you for all I know, I don't know. So anyhow, that's the plan, they get up, of course, the next day to, to, to start this grand adventure to go hear Buddy Holly and Richie Valens, Big Bobber. And it's snowing. And uh, they're like, oh, okay. And my grandfather refuses to let my mom and her friends go in the new car. And my mom is furious. She's like, you cannot tell me what to do. I'm five years old. I need to be able to do this. I'm assuming. I don't know how old she really was. She was six when she had me. Uh, so anyhow... She, she was just furious because you, you can't tell me what to do. I got my own car, I got my own job. We can do this. And, and of course, over the course of the day, my grandfather eventually made sense and my mom and her three girlfriends realized that it was a lot of hassle and the weather was going to make it worse and they'd still have to go to work. None of them could get the day off from work and so they just didn't go to the concert. And of course... A few hours later, the plane crash happened, and the music died. Now, my mom loved Buddy Holly. What was she going to do now that Buddy Holly was no longer making music? Well, what she did was she ran into my dad. Now, that is not a good trade, Buddy Holly, for my dad. But it seemed to work out okay for my mom. But my dad's favorite musician was not Buddy Holly. My dad had a different favorite musician. His name, and he went by one name, Elvis. So my mom had to learn to appreciate Elvis. A little more than she was used to. Obviously, everybody in the 50s appreciated Elvis at one level or another. It was the only way you could actually wear jeans in public. But uh, she was not an Elvis person, and she was a Buddy Holly person. And I can remember, on one of my birthdays when I was a kid, I opened up one of my, one of my I was, must have been five, six, seven years old, somewhere in that range. I opened up a present from my dad, which, I, you know, I never knew my dad could actually buy presents for me. I just assumed he just had his, my mom just put his name on him. And uh, it was from my dad, and it was, a, it was an LP of Elvis Presley's Greatest Hits. About 10 minutes later, I opened a present up from my mom. It's an LP of Buddy Holly's. Yeah. So... So, you, so I grew up kind of, a, I, I just knew this story, you know, I mean, that's just part of the story. My mom would tell it this time of year, or a bad snowstorm, or I'd be listening to Buddy Holly, or Elvis would come on the radio, we'd come up in conversation. That's how it happened. 
Well, we don't think too much about it in our family. That's just one of the stories that happens uh, to my mom. But all of a sudden, somewhere around the 20, when I was about 20 years old, and I told this story to somebody. I was trying to impress somebody, a young lady, who knows, maybe talking at a bar, who knows, I'm 20 years old. Maybe I was playing with band, I can't remember. And everybody goes, that is so cool. And there comes a time in your life when you realize that your parents were cool and you know your life is over. Because, I mean, there's really, once you find out your parents are cool, there's really nothing left to do but get a job, stoke the engines of commerce, and wait until you die. That's all there's left. And I was like, what? How could that be cool? And they're like, yeah, Buddy Holly. Yeah, that's cool. So about, oh, I don't know, two, three, four months ago, two, three months ago, my daughter got engaged. My daughter got engaged to a guy who is a rock musician, which Chris and I are very happy for because the, the steady employment of a rock musician is, is something that, that she can count on, uh, Maddie can count on growing in the future. I mean, we're much, much more thankful that he has a steady job like that rather than something like a government employee where he can be shut down. And uh, so he's a musician, and he meets my mom. Now, he doesn't know my mom, right? He, he know, Maddie has told him about her grandma and things like that. And, so he's talking about, he's, he, and, and he's a musician, so my mom, she says, what kind of music do you like? And he asks my mom what kind of, and she says, Buddy Holly, and she tells this story. Same story I just told you. Grandpa wouldn't let her go, all that kind of stuff. And my mom is done telling the story, and David is just entranced. He's just staring at my mom, jaw on the floor, just looking at her. And Maddie and Chris and I and whoever else was there, we're like, what is this dude? And he's like, your mom, your grandma, she is the coolest person I've ever met. I mean, my mom just passed Jesus on the way up to the top. And we're just like, for not going to a concert? You're kidding me. He's like, that is so cool. Now we all know that time goes on. And we do know that because of the tragic plane crash 60 years ago today, Buddy Holly stopped making music. Don McLean even wrote a song about the day the music died. But that's still part of who my mom is. And it's part of what she does and how she lives and behaves. And even though for people like Maddie or me or Chris who've heard the story over the last 30 years, we don't think too much about it, but when it's told to somebody who doesn't know, all of a sudden, how they relate to my mother changes. How they think about who she is and what she's about. She's no longer a grandmother of two and a great-grandmother who lives in Florida and does all that kind of stuff, but rather she's somebody who once was cool and probably still is, because the last concert Buddy Holly ever did, my mom was at. And it seems that that is what's going on with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are experiences that are embedded into our lives that, that we no longer think about, we no longer worry about, we no longer uh, participate in, but are integral to who we are. And as we move forward, they're going to be integral to our identity and how we behave. So for the fact of the matter, most of us who are sitting in this room are here because somebody immigrated into this country. Somebody, whether they came from Denmark or whether they came from Sweden or Germany or whatever the case may be, all of us, except for the few of us who may have some Native American blood, got here because somebody got on a boat or walked across a boundary and came to this country. And we haven't thought much about it, Oh, every now and then we'll have an able skeever, or every now and then I'll make jokes about Scandinavians and Nordics, but we don't think too much about our immigration and our, heri and our immigrant past. But it's part of us. It's part of our identity. And for those people who are coming into this country or hoping to come into this country from Honduras or El Salvador or Guatemala, the, the groups that we'll primarily be working with through the Amparo program, that makes us cool. We're cool to them because our ancestors were able to do what they 
are hoping to do themselves. And as we look forward to what God is doing in the world, do not forget our past and our history. Do not forget the things that make us who we are today. These stories that are part of our lives that, that no longer seem seminal or understanding to what we are, but indeed have colored our very existence for being right here, right now. And these are the very things that people who are struggling today are looking for. And the same thing was true with Jesus. After a while, they long since forgotten that he changed the water into wine back there in Cana. But they asked him to heal. They asked him to cure. Martha asked him to raise her brother from the dead. And all those things happened because once there was a little boy named Jesus. Once there was a little boy named Jesus who grew up in the town of Nazareth. And when he was in the town of Nazareth, the people of Nazareth took care of him and raised him. They taught him how to live. They taught him how to read. They taught him how to be a good boy. And he went and became a good young man. Now, he didn't perform miracles for his family and friends in Nazareth because he knew they didn't need it. They didn't need the miracles because they had the boy. And as he lived and grew as a young man, he not only then became a good young man, but he became a great young man. And in the process of his living and his dying, he was resurrected to become a great God. And that is our legacy. And let us never forget that the things that we've long since forgotten, like our own baptism, like the people who taught us about the faith, are who we are today as well. And just because we may have forgotten, God does not.